All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. Thank you all so much for tuning in today for our webinar um, entitled Colorado Community Pharmacy Enhanced Patient Care Services. Um, this is a part of our chronic disease management and prevention project that we are also working with the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment on. So we're really excited to have you all here today. Um, and excited for, for our speaker to be able to present to you on this topic. Um, my name is Katie Guthmiller. I am the program coordinator at HealthLinks, and um, I'll just be doing a little quick intro. A little bit about us. Um, hopefully, most of you are familiar with HealthLinks already, but in case you're not, we are a mentoring program based at the Colorado School of Public Health that champions health and safety at work. We offer evidence-based healthy workplace certification and advising to help organizations and their team members achieve total worker health. I um, wanted to mention that we are also partnering with the Skag School of Pharmacy today, which is just down the road, so really excited to have them on board for this webinar. Quick agenda for today, um, we're going to start with a presentation from Dr. Wesley Neufer. Um, then we'll move to a question and answer. So if you have any questions, um, please feel free to save them for the end and we'll hopefully get to them. Um, and then quick closing wrap up and, and what's coming up next. Just some general housekeeping before we get started. All participants will be kept on mute throughout the duration of the presentation. This webinar is being recorded and we will be sending a link to that in the follow-up email in case there's something you wanna go back and revisit or share with other colleagues. Um, please use the chat function for any technical issues that you have, and I'm here to help you with that. Um, if you have a question for our speaker, please use the Q&A box in the control panel of your screen. And as I mentioned, we will get to those at the end. Um, there will be a survey at the end of this webinar, so we would love for you to take a minute to complete this. All right, our speaker for today is Dr. Wesley Neufer. Uh, Dr. Neufer is an associate professor at the University of Colorado Skagg School of Pharmacy. He is an assistant director of experiential programs where he works to place students in various pharmacy practice settings across their curriculum. Currently, Dr. Neufer is working on a variety of funded initiatives involving transforming community pharmacy practice to patient-centered care models. Dr. Neufer's experience is in experiential education, diabetes, obesity, and immune immunizations, and his clinical practice is in the endocrinology department at the University of Colorado Hospital. In his spare time, Dr. Neufer enjoys the martial arts and the great outdoors of Colorado with his family. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Neufer, and you can go ahead and take it away. Thank you, Katie. And I would like to uh, thank HealthLinks for giving me this opportunity as well. Um, it's always exciting to be able to talk about some of the things that we're doing. So what I wanna to talk to you today about is some programs that we are really focused on in the community pharmacy setting. And uh, so uh, my background, when I graduated, I am an alum of CU um, School of Pharmacy and I went into community practice and was really motivated to do a lot of the things that I'm talking about today, um, but there was a whole lot of barriers and there, there still are some, but, but things are, the landscape is much sunnier than it was in the past. and. Um, and I'm gonna kind of go through a little bit um, as to why that is. Um, but I did wanna go ahead and, and just start out this talk um, with a poll. So currently, um, those of you on the call, how many of you go to a local community pharmacy somewhere uh, around your neighborhood um, to fill uh, one or, or more of your prescriptions? I'll just give people a minute to answer. We've still got some responses coming in. All right, go ahead and share the results. All right, excellent. Um, I'm pleased to see that. It's uh, one of the challenges that, uh, that we face is, is that we're not always in control of, of our own options. Um, I recently was was mandated to wear um, on routine uh, maintenance medications, um, which my son gets, that we have to use mail order. And so it's frustrating because I really do believe in the, in the community pharmacist um, relationship to, to their patients. And, I, and that's some of what I'm gonna talk about today. All right, so the practice of pharmacy has really changed over the last um, couple decades. 
we transitioned to a PharmD only degree right around um, the year 2000 um, nationally and, and Canada followed in our footsteps. And before this, it was a, there was a bachelor's degree available for pharmacy practice, but now um, the only degree is a doctorate in pharmacy. And, and what that extra schooling really involved was a lot more therapeutics and a lot more pharmacology. So a lot more knowledge um, about diseases. Um, pharmacists have always not known about the medications, but the depth of the disease knowledge really was one big focus when the PharmD um, degree became mandated. Um, community practice itself has really changed. When I first was uh, going into community practice, there was still a pretty good margin to be made. Um, you would buy your medications at one point and sell them at another one, but that margin has really gone down. And, and a lot of people don't understand that because it is high dollar. Um, some of these medications, as you know, are thousands of dollars, sometimes per month. Um, but the problem is, is that that's not a pharmacy profit. We, we buy high and, and, and sell, uh, you know, and the insurance covers um, very close to our margin. And so the traditional model of, of dispensing prescriptions and, and being able to uh, cover salary is really not something that is the case anymore. And so um, particularly for the individual community pharmacy, um, the mom and pop shop, which I always hold near and dear to my heart. Um, it's, it's the model, uh, we still see it in rural Colorado, but it's the old pharmacy model with the soda fountain in the, in the store and, and you would kind of get to know your, your patients and their families and, and know everybody by name. And, and that really transitioned with some of the bigger chain pharmacies, um, again, except in specific locations. And unfortunately, um, community independent pharmacies are quickly going the way of the dinosaur if they if they're not able to evolve and, and change because of because of a lot of these market pressures that are that are occurring. So what is our role? Um, and this is something I think we really struggle with as a profession because um, if, if the data out there really shows that that you all that that people trust their pharmacists, we're among the most trusted professions. Um, but they really don't understand exactly what a pharmacist does outside of, you know, everyone sort of envisions the community pharmacist in the grocery store or the Walgreens. Um, there's a lot other uh, options available for today's pharmacist. Um, there's a lot of practices in hospitals and, and physician offices. But my focus today is really on this community practice because of the accessibility. The numbers are you know, somewhere between 12 and 30 times a year that our pharmacist is going to make a touch to a patient because we're seeing you not just when you're sick, but we're seeing you routinely as you come through and, and fill your prescriptions. And so uh, that accessibility as far as promoting immunizations, as far as talking about any changes that have happened um, and, and overall caring for your health is, is something that pharmacists are by far the most accessible healthcare profession out there. Um, drug related problems are huge. That's another entire talk in itself. I could go on and on about um, you know, herbal products and over-the-counter products and, and things that people get online or, or just several different medications from different providers, transitions of care when, when someone enters a hospital and they get on different medications while they're in the hospital and then they transition back home. All of these are times when there can be therapeutic duplications where someone's taking two drugs for the same problem or maybe got put on a drug for a problem that was, was acute and was, was not something that was long-term come home and they're still on this medication and they really never should be. And so there are a huge um, area of opportunities for pharmacists to really just sit down and go over the complete medication profile and, uh, and really help patients um, sort through a lot of that information. All right, adherence is, uh, is one area that any healthcare professional and, and really the data suggests any even health coach can help with. But the challenging thing with adherence is, is that any intervention that we do is short term. If, if, uh, if, if I help you and I sit down today and I really emphasize why it's important for you to take the medications that you're prescribed, um, the data shows that for a few months that, that, that intervention works really well. And then by six months, you're almost back to baseline on your behavior. And, and there's a lot of things that affect adherence the more times a day that you have to take something. I mentioned my, my son, he has a, a congenital muscle disorder and, and he's supposed to take one pill four times a day and, and both of his parents are pharmacists and boy, we still struggle to get him every one of those doses because we're busy lives and taking something four times a day is challenging. And so, uh, so there's a real role here. Um, I've, done, I've done entire presentations on adherence and, and this is always um, staggering to me for, if, if you're a physician and you write 100 prescriptions, 
um, you're down to about 50, 20%, 15 to 20% are refilled as prescribed. So right out the door, there's about a half to um, a third of, of patients, they're just either not ready for the medication or it's not covered or they can't afford it. And so it just never even gets to the pharmacy. And then out of the ones that do get there, then now you know the price and maybe you go home and you look it up on the internet and, and, and the numbers go down to where you're really not leaving with that drug. And then even when you're leaving with the drug, now we're down to a third that are actually being used the way they're supposed to. And then, as I mentioned, down to about a fifth that are being taken long term. And so this is a huge problem. Um, as mentioned, I, I work in endocrinology. We assume with diabetes that you're taking everything. And so when I'm measuring your lab values to see how your diabetes is controlled, um, when it's not controlled, we're assuming that all the meds are doing their job and, and we're looking to increase medications. And so when adherence is a problem, you can really see this be something that is an issue because um, it starts to be something where suddenly you decide, okay, I, I need to be adherent, I need to control this disease. And unfortunately, if we have you on a whole bunch of medications at that time, that can really cause some bad outcomes. And so the answer to this is having conversations. It's, it's getting to know your patients. It's taking the time to sit down and have a conversation with your patients around their medications and their health. All right, this Flip the Pharmacy initiative is something that I'm pretty excited about. This is a national movement um, that's really come out of, of a group called CPSN, um, which is a, uh, they call themselves Accountable Pharmacy Organization, an APO. So some of you may be familiar with an ACO, Accountable Care Organization, where it's a group of practices that really are working together to manage um, a population of patients and they provide all the care and try and cost save. And so basically what CPSN is trying to do is set up a network of pharmacies that are really doing the services that I'm going to talk about here. Um, enhanced services, patient-centered care, the tagline you can see at the bottom is moving from a moment in time of filling prescriptions to taking care of patients over time um, as we transition to where our, our focus should be on the patients and that is really what this initiative is doing. And so what it is, is it's a two-year program that really breaks all of these things down into manageable monthly bites and really helps all the pharmacies convert what they're doing one month at a time while still practicing and still doing all the things you have to do in a day. Um, when you talk to people that, that really want to change their pharmacies, everyone wants to do it, but nobody has time. You know, I've got all these scripts to fill today. I've got all these things that are demanding my time, and now this is one more thing. And so this initiative has really helped to um, transform the practice and, and manageable bites. You have a champion in the store that really sits down and goes through what needs to happen that month. And, and, and bit by bit, you begin to implement these changes that I'm going to describe next um, to where the pharmacies look very, very different after two years. All right, so in Colorado, um, we've been very fortunate to have a couple uh, health departments, CDPHE, Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment, has been absolutely paramount in, in their support to uh, help us with these independent pharmacies and implement these services. Um, as I mentioned, when I first wanted to do this, there were a ton of barriers and still on the billing side of things, uh, there is not the reimbursement for pharmacist time. Labor is, is the most expensive piece. And so we need what we call a proof of concept. We need to show payers and employers, groups like yourselves, um, that we can really make a difference in patients' health and really generate the data that's going to be able to go then to a third-party insurance plan and say, you know, we will manage your most difficult patients, your highest utilizers. There's a, a very small percentage of the population, somewhere around 10 to 20 percent, that's using 80 to 90 percent of, of the healthcare dollars in our country because they're very complex patients. And those are the patients that we are really looking at when we start managing patients. So we're, we're wanting to care for everybody, but we really want to focus on that small percentage that's consuming so much of the healthcare um, system and really optimize their health so that they're not going to the hospital, so they're not going to the ED and they're not, um, and they're not as sick. And that's really um, what we've wanted to do. And so the model is, is that uh, the School of Pharmacy, uh, I am partnering with a whole bunch of independent pharmacies and really helping them implement these services. And CDPHE, it's around cardiovascular disease and diabetes, and we'll look at that in more detail. And then I'm also working with Tri-County Health Department, which is the uh, Adams, Arapahoe, and Douglas County here closer to, uh, to Denver, closer to home, 
um, specifically on some smoking cessation work where we're um, one of the exciting things in pharmacy that we'll talk about is pharmacists can now um, take a specialized training and become specialists in, in helping people quit smoking. And, and so that's a big goal with that initiative is to really get that um, up and going and, and helping patients quit, quit smoking. All right, so these are the different locations um, where we actually have pharmacies that are doing these specialized services. Most of these are independent pharmacies. There are a couple um, within like a health system like Valley Wide Health Centers in Alamosa and La Junta. And then uh, there's a couple like that, but most of these are mom and pop pharmacies, many in rural areas, um, some of which there may not even be a, a, a medical practice in that town. And so you do see a much bigger scope of practice for the pharmacist in these areas where they don't have all the resources that we're used to here in Denver. And, and so there is a real role for helping patients understand their diseases and, and really working with them to optimize their health. And again, you could do an entire talk on the disparities of, of rural areas across the country where there's just not as many healthcare professionals, there's not as much access to specialty care, and there's a real need for these education services to really help people understand what their disease is and what they can do to really minimize the complications. And, and again, the, the, the literature is very clear that this is an ongoing conversation and it's not something that should happen one time, it should be happening over a lifetime. And it's something that you really do want to establish trust and a relationship with your patients. And it's very difficult to do that if, if your patients are going to a different pharmacy every single time or mandated mail order. So this model is really bringing things back to where you know your pharmacist, where your pharmacist isn't hidden way out in the back of the pharmacy where you can't see them, but they're coming out front, they're sitting down in a, in a private consultation area, and they're spending somewhere between five and 15 minutes one-on-one -on -one with you talking about your health and, and your, um, your disease states and, and really spending that time um, outside of the pharmacy, spending it with patients. So here are some examples of uh, services that, that have been going. MTM or medication therapy management is really the well, most well known because this is something that Medicare put in place um, several years ago where um, as any Medicare Part D plan that pharmacists would offer this service and it's very targeted. It's, it's management to those patients that have been identified as having the most risk. So patients that are on many different medications, patients that are on certain disease states, um, and they're basically, there's these third party software programs that flag these patients. And if they go to your pharmacy, you can pull up this database and you can identify that this is a service that needs to, needs to be offered. And so this is something that's been going on across community pharmacy for several years now, um, but it's very suboptimal. And there's a number of reasons why. And, and the biggest reason why is because um, it, is, it really is intended to have that community pharmacist patient relationship, but in the vast majority of cases, you might be hearing from a pharmacist that you don't even know. So some plans have pharmacists in other states that are calling you. Patients don't fully understand the role of this. Why would I need to talk to you? My doctor talks to me about these things. Why do I need to talk to my pharmacist? We like it to be face-to-face -face and we ask patients to come in whenever possible. And again, there's a misunderstanding as to why they need to come into the pharmacy because Typically in the past, the pharmacist has really been tied more to the dispensing role and not to the education role. And so, you know, why, why is this? It's just a growing, a growing pains type of thing. But in its, in its true form, and there's now what's called an enhanced MTM that's being piloted, um, where it really engages the pharmacist that patients know and recognize, and, and that person is, is providing the care and then communicating all of the information that they talked about back to the primary care provider. And that's another area that we're working very uh, highly on because that communication piece needs to be there. If I'm providing all this great education and information to patients about their medications and about their diseases, but the doctor and the, and the PA and the rest of the healthcare team has no idea what I've done, um, there could be re redundancies where we're giving the same information. It's, it's inefficient and it really is just not um, the way to integrate pharmacy services into the rest of the interprofessional team. And so it's very important that, number one, I can access information from the medical record. I know what your allergies are. I know any hospitalizations you've had recently. I know things beyond what the dispensing software 
um, shows me and that I'm able to communicate information back to the providers on what we've really talked about. And so medication therapy management uh, can be, there's a CMR, a comprehensive medication review, where it's really going over all the medication, or it can be very targeted, where we're looking at one specific thing, like you need to be on a statin because you're at high risk of a heart attack and stroke, and so we would really like to, you to, to have that, or if you have diabetes, we want to maximize the use of metformin because of it, how important that is and some of those things. All right, um, so uh, at that, I'm going to have another poll here. And this is another thing that, uh, that we generally do quite a bit, and that is vaccinations. And so I'd be interested in how many of you have gotten a vaccination from the community, community pharmacy. We'll just give it a minute for people to respond and then I'll share the results. All right, there are the results. Okay, and that's, uh, and that's actually a little bit surprising to me because uh, this is again, one area that uh, pharmacy has been really well known for, and that is, is that, uh, that we're providing vaccinations and, and have been for some time. And uh, in, in many cases, the physician has actually uh, kind of handed that off to the pharmacist um, as a role. I know in, in rural areas, sometimes with flu shots, um, that the pharmacies will actually get the vaccine in before the physician's office. And, and, uh, and that's simply because it's sometimes a big buying group and those types of things. But these are all of the different vaccinations that um, we can provide. Everybody thinks of the flu shot and, uh, and, and schedules it around that October date. And indeed, the pharmacies are very busy with that. Um, but there's a lot of other ones, right? Um, Shingrix is the new shingles vaccine. It is tremendously better than, than the previous shingles vaccine. Any of you that got the old sh shingles vaccine, the Zostavax should go and get the Shingrix series um, because it's much more effective. Um, any of you that have gotten it, you're probably rubbing your arm in, in memory because the Shingrix does have um, an adjuvant that causes a little bit of injection pain at the site. Um, so you will notice that you, that you receive that when you get it. Um, but there's other opportunities, right? Um, HPV and meningococcal for teens. Teens, any of you that have teenagers at home, I have a 13-year-old now, and, and just keeping up with their daily life is, is exhausting. And so keeping them uh, going to, to physicians and, and getting their, their routine examinations can be very challenging in that age group. And so this is a great opportunity for the required or, or the very highly recommended vaccines for, for them to receive. Um, and then there's some, some other ones as well. So there's a whole bunch of different vaccines that pharmacists can give. Um, I trained the students on immunization, so I hear every horror story of when a vaccine goes wrong. So uh, if some of you had a bad experience in the pharmacy, I'm sorry. We, we are working very hard to get the injection technique exactly the way it's supposed to. But again, I, I hear every time someone in my office or someone in the, in the, uh, in the pharmacy school goes and has a, has a vaccine that, that they that either hurt more or, or whatever. Um, but this is a huge role um, for today's pharmacists to be doing. And then travel vaccines is another whole, um, a whole field. And it's not just vaccinations, right? It's, it's you actually go through CDC maps and, and make recommendations as far as, as if malaria is a risk and, and what you might need to take with you. And some very specific recommendations for traveling around the world. And hopefully we'll be able to get back to traveling around the world at some point. Um, this is something that I think pharmacy does very well. And so I would highly recommend if you're going anywhere um, that, is, that is a developing country that you, you access a travel health clinic and get all of the recommendations so that you stay safe and, and enjoy your trip to the, to the most. All right, so moving beyond that, medication synchronization. This is something that, that is also pretty well um, established across all community pharmacy where anybody who is taking three or more medications, they really try and get them to where people are picking all of the scripts up on the same day. Um, and the, the point of this is, is really to optimize the time so that you're not having somebody come in every week to get something. One of the things that really changed in pharmacy practice across the time I was there is, is the inventory. And so there was a real push to carry a low inventory, a low cost of drugs, and the frustration to patients, and I'm sure many of you have experienced this, 
is the fact that anytime you go in, they don't have your full amount. So you're getting partials and you gotta go back and get the rest of them. And, and that's because um, when they really don't know if the medication is going to be dispensed or not, um, there's been a real pressure to not have a whole bunch of the money tied up in, in inventory on your shelves and to order it as it's needed, and that's very hard to predict. And so if someone else comes in and gets the medication you're on the same day, then lo and behold, we don't have extra and we don't have it for you. By arranging medication synchronization, this is one way that we can make sure that on the day that you're coming, and, and, and with Flip the Pharmacy, we take it a step further and we really say, hey, what day is good for you when you can dedicate an extra 10 or so minutes where you can spend with me, the pharmacist, and we can really go through some of these things. And so it's, it's not only optimizing when you pick this up, but it's also asking a commitment from you as the patient to sit down and be able to go through a consultation and, and go through all of these things that, that we are talking about here because we're really focused on patient health and sitting down and having one-on-one -on -one interactions. Opioid education and drug abuse is, is a huge problem right now and pharmacy is very much in the middle of this. Um, that a lot of times patients get inadvertently, they have a condition that requires them to get on, on painkillers and lo and behold, they, they, uh, they end up getting dependent on those and, and there can be a real challenge around this. And so there's a lot of, of, of very valuable education that can go around this. A part of it is explaining the difference between dependence and addiction. Um, just because you're dependent on something because you've used it for a while does not mean that you're addicted to that drug. And, and unfortunately, there's a real stigma to that. Um, just knowing alternative options that are available for patients that are very concerned about opioids and what are some options and how well will they work and is this going to be enough. Um, helping to identify providers that have a lot of experience with managing patients properly um, because you know in the past there's been a, a huge misuse of these medications and, and there's a way of using them very properly where you get the best pain control and you minimize some of the aspects that can, that can lead to dependence and addiction. Um, and then entering into some buddy contracts and, and having them only come to your pharmacy because when you start having patients go to multiple pharmacies and multiple providers, that's a real red flag around um, the entire um, opioid problem. So, so just again, this consultations and working with your, with your patients around this field is really important. All right, I mentioned smoking cessation already a little bit. Um, we have statewide legislature that passed now where if pharmacists take a specially trained program that's offered, um, they can actually prescribe any medication for cessation efforts. And I do a lot of work in this area and the numbers um, are dismal across the board. It's hard to quit smoking, very hard to quit smoking. However, um, when you're using somebody that's specially trained and when you're using pharmacologic help, i.e. nicotine replacement therapy, you're more than twice as likely to be successful. And so um, the, the, the version that we have, the, the sort of core version is Ask, Advise, Refer, where we partner with Quitline and the pharmacist is able to do a consultation and really work with the patient and, and select a, an appropriate product and send the patient out the door with medication that they need to help them quit and then refer them to Quitline, which will do all the behavioral pieces, which are also very vital to success in smoking cessation. And there's a lot around this as far as like when you fall off the wagon, you haven't failed, it's, it, you've, just, you've just slipped. And so letting the patient know that, that it's okay to, to, to have that moment where, oh, I found a pack of cigarettes in my garage and, and it relapsed, um, you know, don't just give up. Um, you've made so much progress. And, and again, having that person to talk to and to really help you through the, one of the most difficult things you'll do in your life is absolutely essential and is a really important service that, uh, that pharmacists can, can provide. In some cases, a pharmacist have actually stepped up to a higher tier where they're actually gonna do the behavioral counseling. They'll actually help monitor the CO levels that first week after quitting to show that the, the levels of, of poison in the bloodstream are actually coming down. It's a very nice um, um, objective measure at a time when you're angry at everybody and everything, and it's the hardest time that first week of quitting. It's nice to see, oh, wow, you know, compared to yesterday, my blood is so much cleaner, and, and uh, people can really relate to that. Um, setting quit dates, um, uh, talking about all these little behavioral things, changing the way you drive to work because you light up when you get in the car, so you need to change that behavior. Cleaning even things like your curtains and, and washing every sheet in the house because you'll smell the tobacco and it'll really cue you to want that. These are huge pieces that are important for being successful in, in quitting smoking. 
All right, diabetes self-management education, DSME. Diabetes is a self-managed disease. It's something that 90% of all of the management falls directly on the person who has it. And it's very difficult. This is one of my main, uh, this is what I do in clinic. And so being able to sit down and explain the disease and explain why things are happening and clear up all of the misinformation. The, the internet is a, a vast wealth of knowledge, but it's also a vast hole of misinformation. And, and having a healthcare professional guide patients on what's real and what's true and what's the best information out there and helping as a partner to set goals and to individualize um, how to manage somebody's disease is huge. And, and this is an area that is really growing for pharmacists. The first um, education piece is one-on-one. -on -one. I sit down, the pharmacist sits down and, and goes through the complete um, past of, of the person's knowledge and, and where they're at. And then we transition into these group classes where there's a lot of good group interaction and we really try and pair up people that are new to the disease with people who have had the disease for a long time and really help to educate patients on what that's looking like and, and how they can get better. And, and so there's four group sessions that first year and then a yearly follow-up um, just to check in and see how people are doing. Within this, you're actually doing point of care labs. So we're measuring an A1C, we're measuring cholesterol, we're measuring blood pressures. And these are also new things that are more and more available to the pharmacies. And we'll look at that a little bit. Um, and that's something with this flip the pharmacy that we're really trying to do. Every time you come in, if you have cardiovascular disease or high blood pressure, we sit you down and we measure your blood pressure. And, and we talk to you about what that is and, and how you've been doing, just like you would do at any time you go to the physician office. And Again, people are sort of like, you know, why, why are you doing this? I'm not familiar with this, but this is really the direction we feel that pharmacy is going and that we need to be spending time with our patients and, and optimizing their disease and keeping them out of the hospital and, and non-routine visits to the doctor. All right, for our group format, we use these conversation maps. This is a very highly published successful strategy where patients stand around a huge map on the table and interact together and, and really talk about the disease. And, and it's challenging because the pharmacist really becomes a facilitator. I am not the all answering person that's gonna answer all the questions. I want you to talk through them. And again, we have a dynamic where some people have had diabetes for 20 years and some people are just newly diagnosed. And there's nothing more powerful to that patient than being able to have somebody that's been like, man, I've been there, I totally remember that and you're gonna get through this, and let me tell you what I did. And, and again, just that, that street cred that brings um, forward when, when you have patients interacting together and you just keep the, the conversation moving along and don't get too hung up in, in one area is a very different way of facilitating and it's very powerful. And, and the feedback is routinely very, very strongly positive that patients get a heck of a lot more out of this than let's say a, a full day class right when you're diagnosed three years ago that you barely remember anything. And so the retention is strong, um, the overall um, openness and ability to ask questions is strong and, and there's, it really has facilitated people getting better control of their diabetes and, and avoiding some of the long-term complications that go along with it. And so this is very much the model that we are implementing. All right, the Diabetes Prevention Program, if you're not familiar with this program, this is a preventative program. It's, we screen people that are at risk for diabetes and really work with them to try and reduce their risks. This is a very aggressive program where patients are, are putting in some money, they're paying about $200, and they're getting weekly group classes with a health coach. It's almost like a personal trainer. Um, but it's also focusing on all of the behavioral changes that are important, healthy eating, regular activity, even if it's just walking, specific to each individual. Okay, if you have bad knees, let's help you do this. Weight loss promotion, de decreasing risk factors. And the DPP has very good statistical data that shows that when you work with these health coaches, and this is a, a formal program, these health coaches are, are formally trained through the Centers of Disease Control, and we have to submit data to the CDC on how these programs are doing in order for them to maintain their accreditation. So it's very standardized, but the data is very clear that when you work with these people, that your progression to getting diabetes is, is absolutely cut in half, if not more. Um, the in initial program actually compared it to putting people on medication, diabetes medication, and this program out outperformed the medication, the metformin group that they, that they were put on as far as being able to prevent people to progress 
um, from prediabetes to diabetes. So there's this screening that we give folks, and, and if you screen positive, then yeah, if you have diabetes in your family, if you have certain risk factors, if you have central obesity and some of these things, then yeah, you're at high risk, and, and the chances are, if we do nothing, you will develop type 2 diabetes. This program is only for patients that have not yet been diagnosed, and it really helps to identify these patients and help them um, change your behavior now while the disease has not yet done enough damage to your body that you have to be on medication to really change your lifestyle and hopefully prevent it um, indefinitely. And so the, the small and financial investment is well worth the huge goals that you can get out of the program by working with these health coaches. First six months, it's a weekly program. And then after that, then it's once a month where we just keep checking in and, and helping you and, and slowing that progression or, or stopping the progression from type 2 diabetes. Cardiovascular disease management, we're focused around all of the things cardiovascular disease. So we're doing blood pressure um, measurements. We're promoting you to check your blood pressures at home. There's actually ways that patients can take their blood pressures from home and upload them and put them into a database that I can see as a pharmacist, the physician can see at the office, um, education around diet, again, behavioral changes, and, and again, uh, performing these um, different um, laboratory tests in the, uh, in the pharmacy. Um, so it's another focus around whether cardiovascular disease remains one of the highest um, killers in our country and, and managing that and helping patients understand that is, is a very important service. Okay, so I do wanna do one, another poll here, um, specific to point of care. So how many of you have ever received any sort of testing? Um, so not a, a vaccine, but cholesterol test or an INR, or an A1C or blood pressure or a rapid flu test, any of those types of testing at a community pharmacy. We'll give it just another moment. All right, here are the results. All right, so, uh, so about 10% of you um, have, and not surprisingly, most people have not. This is a very new area, and it's not something that people generally associate with pharmacy practice. Um, but the exciting thing for us is, is that there are a whole bunch of these services that are now available um, for patients. And so these continue to grow. Um, there is going to, there's a COVID one that's now available in the pharmacy for testing. Um, cholesterol, rapid flu, kidney functions, electrolytes, strep throat, HIV, uh, TSH, um, which is a thyroid test, a genetic testing is, is available at the pharmacy. So all of these are lab tests that are given at the pharmacy um, that can give you results without having to, to send them off to a lab um, and, uh, and wait for the results. I can do them right now. I can, in some cases, um, recommend medications for you recommend that hey you do have strep so we need to get you an antibiotic for that um, and a lot of these um, services that, that previously you had to go in and see a physician about and this has really helped our pharmacists um, have these conversations with patients and, and really help them be clinicians um, in this setting. All right and then I, I would I'd be remiss if I didn't bring up the student pharmacist piece. Um, it's important that we're exposing our student pharmacists to this type of care and that they're able to see this innovative type of practice that is likely going to be the future of pharmacy. One thing I tell every com incoming first year student is if you think you're gonna make $100,000 a year by counting by fives in the corner of a, a grocery store, you're sadly mistaken. There's machines and highly tra trained technicians that are taking over that role. And so um, there is a much different um, sort of focus on what pharmacy is going to be as we move into the future. All right, I'm providing several lists of the, these stores just to give you an idea of where these are located. The good news is you don't have to uh, frantically write these down. Um, the, the abbreviations of what the services are and where they're located will be sent out to you um, after this. And so you can see if there's uh, pharmacies in the area that you can engage with and refer. Many of these services are free of charge to the patient um, and, uh, and again, can really prevent bad outcomes. Uh, I'm not gonna, here, are, these are the more rural sites, several good day pharmacies up north, um, down in Pueblo, out uh, southeast Colorado, 
um, and then and then Colorado City and, and City uh, um, Colorado Springs. So don't worry about that list because you will receive it. But I encourage you to go through and look where they are. We we cover most of the state, and we're really able to um, provide a lot of services to patients in need. All right, so moving forward, what, what does that look like? Well, these are the things I'm working on, uh, expanded payment models. We're really trying to establish pharmacies' role in this, and we want to pay the pharmacists for their time. This is what I believe the future will be, which is increasing what the pharmacist does. It wasn't that long ago where our, our state, Colorado State um, law, had pharmacists at, not in the healthcare field, but we were like with plumbers and other technical type of skilled labor folks. And, and we really pushed to say, hey, we should be on the same side of the state board as the physicians and nurses and, and, and uh, dentists and everyone else. And so it's, it's just, again, everyone has trusted their pharmacists for years, but no one's really recognized what role we play and what role we can play. And that's really the first step of what I'm trying to do here is just increase awareness of th these are the things we're doing and, and these are the things we can offer patients followed by looking directly to folks like yourselves and making contracts of we'll take care of all your employees and keep them healthy so you're minimizing missed time at work. We're gonna approach payers, we're gonna uh, see what this enhanced MTM goes, and then again, being able to access the medical record and document in the medical record really is going to help us um, with um, being able to be part of the interprofessional team. All right, so one last survey for you all, and then we're gonna take some questions. So what is the likelihood after learning about this that, uh, that you would uh, refer somebody that need that, uh, to, to one of these sites if you happen to have one in your community to receive these services from one of the pharmacists? All right, looks like it's starting to slow down. Here we go. All right, excellent. I was always uh, a little reluctant if someone's not, not very likely. I, I haven't done my job today, so uh, I'm pleased that that's not the case. Um, I, I appreciate that, that you recognize that these are a resource, and, and I do believe that this will continue to grow and, and prosper. So with that, This is my email. Feel free to email me directly if you need to. I believe that we will also send this slide set out so you will get all that information as well. And I am going to go ahead and turn it back to Katie so we can field any questions you might have. Awesome. Thank you so much, Wes. That was really informative. And admittedly, I didn't know that some of these services were offered at the pharmacy. So um, that, was, that was great. Um, so kind of bookending off of that last poll that we had, um, we have a lot of employers and HR professionals and health and safety professionals in our network. How should um, employers be presenting this information to their employees? And then kind of a part two to that, is there any concern about privacy or confidentiality issues? Well, that's a great question. And I think that there's always that concern, right? Because um, a lot of times the employees don't necessarily want to disclose that they have a certain condition because they don't want um, that to look upon them badly. Um, so uh, first and foremost, a pharmacy as with every other healthcare professional is HIPAA trained and, and that information is, is very private to us. Um, I, would, I would recommend globally, if, if you have a pharmacy in the area, um, to just to, to let the employees know by any means or by several means, because we know that the communication different people receive different ways, that these resources are available. Um, again, the biggest thing is people just don't realize that these are things that pharmacists do. And if they're going to one of the chain locations, the chains are a slower uptake on some of this, again, because of the labor piece and because of corporate pressures. So this is where letting them know that this independent pharmacy is a very different type of practice and, and hey, give it a shot, go in and, and talk to them. And, and once they walk in the door, then the, the pharmacists and the pharmacies will take over and and what you'll find is it generally is a, a very friendly environment and, uh, and people do know who you are and, and it just seems to be a, a nice interaction. And so I think that's where you start. You let people know the resources there. If you have people like the tobacco cessation, I think it's great. We've had employer groups in the past really get behind a movement, whatever you're passionate about. Hey, I'd like everyone to be healthier. 
you know, I'd, I want to prevent diabetes. So everybody that is at risk, let's take the scale. And, and here you can go down the street and join this DPP program and we can make sure you never get diabetes. And those are, those are great avenues to just start the conversation. Great. Thank you so much. So it sounds like um, just making the announcement to all employees at the same time, and that can kind of help um, with some of the privacy or confidentiality issues too, because then you're not maybe um, calling out one specific employee. Right. Yeah, I wouldn't, I would definitely not single them out. But again, our, our whole intention is to promote healthy behaviors and, and preventative medication or preventative medicine, right? And so mm -hmm. uh, it just making it clear that we care about your health. We want you to be healthier as an employee. And here's a resource that we have that can help you with that. And, and really, we're partnering with them. Um, you know, we will be looking um, with my partnership with the Tri-County and with, with CDPHE to establish um, actual uh, uh, contracts with, with employers where we can provide all these services and we can help to advertise what we can do and where they can go just so they realize that as an employer, you care about their health and you, and you want them to access services that will keep them healthier and, and keep them out of the hospital. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, and there'll be more information about this at the end and ways that you can kind of follow up with us about this. But I wanted to point out that um, we're working with employers on helping to um, implement diabetes prevention programs or get their employees connected with them as well. So just wanted to put a plug in for that, that you can reach out to us um, if you're wondering about how you can go about that. Um, we have another question. How does a pharmacy become a community pharmacy with expanded services? Is it just a matter of opting into all of these different trainings and certifications? That's an excellent question. And it really depends on what services that you would want to offer. Um, if you're an independent pharmacy, then, uh, then there are groups that you can join. CPSN, I mentioned, is one group that really will help you with a lot of that. Um, but if you're not ready or willing or wanting to do that, and you have a passion for one of the services, you know, you can certainly reach out to the school, to me, and, and explore what that looks like. I'm partnering with folks in public health and medicine um, with the behavioral health to, on the smoking cessation, and we're not, we're not gonna turn anybody away. Um, what it really takes is getting a feel for um, the time investment and how that can balance with your business model, and we wanna optimize it so that we don't cost you time and money. And so that's really my job is to be able to do these services but do them in a way that you're still going to make money and eventually make more money by offering them. And that's really what I'm working hard with the health departments to do is, is to show this concept and, and expand it to more and more pharmacies that, that want to do it. Great. Um, another question that came in somewhat related is how do you imagine primary care um, or family medicine working together with community pharmacists to manage care collaboratively? Well, I think that's a great question and, and you know, I don't really have to imagine it because we're doing it, but we're doing it in rural areas because those are the areas that need the resource. And so, for example, in Cedar Edge, Colorado, um, which is a really small area out by Montrose, we have pharmacy students that go into the medical office two to four days a week and work in that medical office. And we've done this for a number of years. And at first it was one day a week. Um, and that office will actually absolutely tell you that they would not be able to function without pharmacy student support now. And it, mm. it, it grew, it's, it's been uh, like eight or nine years now, but it really grew out of, uh, we want pharmacy students to understand the, the pressures on the medical side and we want to build that collaboration. And, and out of that, those students now have access to medical records. They can, in the pharmacy, pull up the medical chart um, from that office and work um, with that chart and document in that chart and then they go over and they see patients with the provider side by side in those areas. Um, so with today's telehealth capabilities, you know, the biggest challenge we have is we're in a different brick and mortar building, but what COVID has shown us is that's not necessarily a big deal. And so I see more and more of this happening. If you look at the most, one of the most growing areas for pharmacy employment, it is hiring pharmacists directly into medical practices where you know, today's physicians and nurses and PAs are training side by side with clinical pharmacists in school. We have a very robust IPE program and a professional program at, at CU. And because of that, they train with them. They know the value of the pharmacist. And when they get out, they're advocating and saying, we need a pharmacist on our team. And it, that's really exciting. And so what I want to do is take that a step further and engage that community pharmacist who can be a resource and not just have them hire directly into that practice. So I think that's going to continue to grow, but certainly there's barriers and, and turf things and all sorts of things we need to work through. And that's 
getting that information out of there's enough sick people for all of us. Right. <laughs> Thanks so much. Um, last question that we have is, do all these services that you mentioned apply to Kaiser Permanente members? So that's a good question. So they would. Um, when it comes down to what you would want the, the patients to have, some Kaiser plans restrict um, where you can get your medications. The one, the plan mm -hmm. that I used to have, you have to fill it at Kaiser Pharmacy, and these are not, I mean, Kaiser Pharmacies are, I mean, Kaiser's great at preventative medicine, but they're not great at engaging pharmacy in some areas. Pharmacists aren't even mm -hmm. immunizing in that system yet. And so um, things along the lines of smoking cessation and some of those you could still go to as a resource, um, and, and, but, but there again, then it depends on whether your plan would cover the medications um, and, or whether you're, you're wanting to pay a higher copay to take advantage of the services. So for example, the DPP program has a cost to it, um, but the benefits of getting a weekly coach to help you with all of it well exceeds the, the value of what you're paying. And so in that case, you would pay that one cost and you get those services and, and, and get them all anyway. So yeah, sort of short answer is yes. But, um, and the long answer is, is that we're, we're really working to try and, and see all patients over time. Great. All right, thank you so much. So that was all of our questions. Um, for our participants, if you have any questions that come to mind, um, please feel free to reach out to me. Um, my email will be um, in the slides that I'll show in just a minute. Um, or um, as Dr. Newfer mentioned, you can reach out to him directly uh, to, to find out more about uh, these programs. So I'm just really quickly going to share my screen again and let you know what we have coming up. All right, so if you're interested in continuing this conversation, we are putting together a chronic disease prevention and management employers group. So we would love if you would be interested in joining us for a quarterly breakfast meeting um, to again, just kind of continue this conversation and provide any updated information that we have um, on how you can help your employees in this effort. Um, you'll, there will also be other employers there, so it's a great opportunity to network um, with other employers who are focused on this as well. And um, if you are interested in this, there will be a survey that will pop up when you close out of the webinar. And there's a space where you can uh, mention that you're interested and I'm happy to reach out to you for more information. And last, just thank you so much again for taking the time um, to be with us today. Um, again, there is that survey. Um, and if you saw in the promotions, we are giving away 10 uh, $25 gift cards. So there is a spot where you can put your email in that survey, which will enter you into that drawing. Um, and then I'll be following up with you later this month to um, let you know if you won. Uh, again, you can reach us at contact at healthlinkscertified.org if you have any questions. Um, in a follow-up email going out tomorrow, we'll have the recording of this presentation as well as the PowerPoint slides um, and the uh, list of pharmacies that Dr. Newfer mentioned earlier. Um, and if you have any questions for him, his email is on those slides as well. So, and I'm happy to connect you. Uh, so thanks so much for tuning in. Um, I hope you have a great rest of your Wednesday and thank you again, Wes. Thank you.